Okay, right. I think we'll uh, make a start. Um, try and keep everybody to time. So um, thank you, uh, everybody, for joining the call today. Um, the fact that I can see so many faces means that the webinar software is working, uh, which is great. Um, so it's a good test. We've jumped the first hurdle. Um, hopefully there's nobody else struggling to get in at the minute. Um, so um, I hopefully you all had a chance to see um, the brief agenda that I sent around for the call. Um, so the, the kind of focus for today is to talk about the uh, initial um, high level specification that I circulated before Christmas. So focusing on modeling opportunity data. Um, so what I wanted to do is kind of get your initial feedback on that today and have um, a bit of a discussion around a few of the issues. Um, but to uh, kick things off, because there's a, a few new faces here, uh, new to me anyway, um, I'm wondering if we can quickly go around and do brief introductions. Uh, maybe you can just uh, introduce yourself um, and just say where you're from or what project you're working on. Um, uh, I'll go first for those of you who haven't met me. So uh, I'm Lee Dodds and I'm an associate at the Open Data Institute. Uh, and I'm coordinating this, this standards activity work as part of the uh, Open Active program. Uh, I'm going to go down the list. So, Duncan, do you want to go next? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Duncan Jones. I work for BUCS, which stands for British University and College Sport. Um, I've been in post for a couple of months, so it's a relatively new role. Um, we are a membership organisation representing all. Uh, academic institutions or higher education academic institutions in the UK, so 165 university members. Um, our uh, data collection, data provision, data services to our members, which is essentially the institutions, but it's every all students playing sport, um, has hitherto been fairly poor. Um, and one of my one of the reasons I've been brought in is to uh, improve that significantly. Um, previous to that, I was working on upshot.org.uk, um, which is a monitoring evaluation platform for uh, not-for-profit sport organisations, uh, and have been very keen through, through working with Nick and, and the Open Active platform to, to be part of these conversations. Uh, and I hope very much to be able to feed in the, the views of uh, our members, so universities, um, around data and sport opportunities and participation. Great, thank you. Uh, Nick, do you want to go next? Oh, oh yeah. Yay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Two Nicks. Uh, the other Nick Evans is in the other box. I don't know which way. They're. Maybe they're all different on every screen, so I can't point, but um, it's like a game show. Uh, so the, uh, uh, yeah, so I am, yeah, hi, I'm Nick. Uh, for those of you who haven't met, we haven't yet met, um, I think maybe all of you know me. Uh, but anyway, uh, for context, I am uh, working with the Open Data Institute um, sector specialist on this program to um, help us move Open Active forward um, and uh, also work for IMIN. Uh, today and on all these calls, I'll be representing the views of myself <laughs> and in so much as W3C groups concerned. Great, thanks, Nick. Um, Alex? Yeah, so uh, hi all. Um, so, Alex Rita, I work for London Sport. Um, and I'm currently deployed within the London Legacy Development Corporation. So I currently manage a physical activity program uh, at People Active Park, uh, which is supporting me. Um, I've been working on Open Active since early ish 2016, uh, with uh, I suppose twofold from an opportunity to uh, educate and advocate the use of open data with our partners. Uh, so we, we have a, a, around 20 different uh, delivery organizations, which ranges from the two leisure operators within the Olympic Park, when this was Olympic Park, which is GLL and, and, and Lee Valley, um, as well as a, a group of national governing bodies and independent organizations such as our parks, which are now um, uh, publishing or, or, or have uh, published all their, their data and are part of Open Active. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, like, I suppose, one angle. And then the other angle, uh, as of hopefully very early in February, uh, the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park website would uh, act as a shop window for local users, uh, local customers, local residents to 
uh, fine all the activities in and around the park um, that have been open via uh, or open data uh, or, or published through the Open Active platform. So uh, representing, I suppose, the views of the program uh, and, and kind of, yeah, my views from a liaison with um, organizations that are currently sitting on data as such and opportunities. Um, as well as someone that have uh, been sort of working on it um, over the last almost year. Great, thanks, Nick. Um, Marcus. Hi, uh, Marcus Tavanley. Uh, uh, currently working for Lancashire County Council. Um, the reason I'm here is I know I'm new to this to this game to some degree. Is uh, we're working with uh, two programs, which is the LGA Needs to Service Finder programs. You may be aware of some people may not be aware of, but that's about pulling service directories together into one open platform, and then repurposing that directory for other uses. And the uses that we're looking at specifically is around well-being prevention and social prescription. Um, and uh, working with closely working with health partners to try and thinking about that data, so needs to service data and the, and the, the intelligence that, that can bring into your personal health record as well. Um, and then that also brings in the, the uh, ODI work that um, Open Act have been doing that our local uh, provider that we're working with, FETL, um, Team FETL, they're, they're, we're working close with them to see if we can bring the two programs together uh, and then that can fit into the wider, the wider Connect Health Cities program, which is happening in Lancashire uh, under the guise of Tech and Hadley, which is the lead for us in Lancaster University as well. So I'm sort of here to sort of try and make sure that if there is any synergy between the two programs, uh, so we can on the ground make absolute use of, of, of that data that from an LGA program and uh, the Open Active program as well. So thanks. Great. Thanks, Marcus. Um, ben? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I'm Ben from IMIN. I'm working on um, Get Active, which is an activity finder um, for people to find sport and physical activity, which already uses um, some open data. And also um, a different website called Open Sessions, which allows grassroots sports clubs um, to um, make their sessions available as open data and surface it in places like Get Active, Get Active London, um, which has a couple of thousand visitors a month at the moment. Great, thank you. Um, Luke? Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Luke. Um, I work for BookWen. Uh, we're an online booking software uh, company and we're participating in, in this. Uh, we're really happy to see what opportunities we could bring to some of the businesses that use our software. Uh, we have lots of different uh, activity types, but quite a large proportion of our users are providing uh, opportunities uh, in the context of this project. So seeing how we can uh, give them a platform elsewhere beyond our software um, so they can share their um, opportunities with as many people as possible. And um, hopefully today we'll be able to just provide some perspective on the way that we see uh, categorizing some of our opportunities and, and if we can kind of comply with, with some of the things that are being put forward uh, on this agenda. Great, thank you. Mike? Hello, I am Mike from Porism Limited. We're partners with the local government association in all things to do with data and data sharing across local authorities. Um, I'm loosely involved with the project that Marcus has talked about, which he called Needs to Serve, but includes a schema for a, a service directory issued by service providers, and that's a schema that's been put together by local government standards body. Um, and I'm interested in synergies between the two and the extent to which they align and or can share vocabularies and approaches. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, who's next on the list? Uh, Ardi Bourbon. Sorry, I don't know your first name. Hi, yeah. Um, my name is Raymond de Bourbon. Uh, I am the solutions architect uh, at a well in the leisure division for the Omnico Group, um, and uh, we <coughs> write uh, 
and sell software, uh, which is for uh, all aspects of a leisure management provider. Um, the, uh, we are fairly new to the uh, to this whole group, of, uh, and we're, and were recently introduced uh, because of our ties through Lee Valley. Uh, but the bulk of our user base is local authorities uh, who have a uh, increasing need to share their data in an open way um, to uh, maximise healthcare benefits and wellness uh, you know, as a whole. So. Um, uh, our, our interest, you know, say our interest, but it's really, uh, you know, I can only express my views here, uh, is um, to try and uh, help steer things uh, in terms of what we do from a software management point of view uh, and how local councils currently use our software to, uh, to run all their leisure and well-being services, uh, you know, from what we see. Um, so, yeah. That's it. Great, thank you. A PK? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Hi, I'm Paul Kane. I'm from Kappa. Uh, we're a group messaging product for sports clubs. Um, so our interest is primarily in things like venue information. So it's quite interesting to see the stuff that you guys have proposed so far. Um, and also if there's anything we can contribute back from our application and interested in that too. Great, thank you. Sally? Hello, I am Sally Jenkinson. I'm also an ADI associate and part of the team who's been working on the project uh, to date. Thank you. Uh, Jamie? Uh, hi, I'm Jamie. I'm CEO of My Local Pitch and we provide a search and booking platform for sports facilities. We work with a number of different venues and operators in London, Dublin and soon to be Manchester, uh, providing them with a way to gain users uh, and uh, take bookings. And as such, uh, I'm pretty interested in how this data can be published and presented to users uh, in, in a good way. Great, thank you. Um, Jade. Hi, um, I'm Jade. I work for an organisation called the Exercise Movement and Dance Partnership. We're the National Governing Body for Group Exercise. Um, we're a membership organisation um, representing um, member organisations. There's about uh, 55 of them, people like Zumba, British Military Fitness, Club of Size, etc. Um, and then represent about um, 10,000 teachers who deliver group exercise classes in the community. Um, all different styles, etc. Um, we own um, and run a search facility called Class Finder for group exercise, which has about eighty thousand visits a week, um, and sort of it's got about thirty thousand activity um, data on, on at the moment. And we've just developed a, a new database and CRM system to sort of manage and um, look after all group exercise activities of all of our members, et cetera. And so we're, we're very interested um, in this group and opening up our data and um, servicing our member organisations for opening up their data and feeding it through the um, relevant websites and search facilities as well. Great, thank you, Jade. Um, Andy? Hello everyone, um, it's Andy Sloper from Active Devon. Um, we're a county sports partnership covering Devon. Um, our main interest in this work is in actually helping a lot of our partners, um, the community partners actually offering activity at all different levels, um, a means of making visible um, the, their opportunities to people um, and, and how partners can actually share information about the, the, the activities that they are um, providing. Thank you. Um, does the other Andy want to go as well? Andy Robinson. Uh, yep, okay. Sorry about the confusion there. So yes, I'm Andy Robinson. Uh, like Paul Kane, I'm just the other side of a thin wall from here in Wimbledon. Uh, we are, a, I'm from Report Lab. We're a company, Python-based company that makes a lot of reporting and visualization software. But more recently, we've launched an initiative called OpenTrack to try and make athletics and running work more efficiently through use of open data. 
So we're building up uh, open reference data sets of the venues. So every, every certified track in the UK is being pointed at the moment. All the organisations in the sport, uh, the clubs, federations, leagues and so on that they belong to. And I hope over time, quite a lot of the competitions as well, although it's, we're more geared towards organised club <coughs> competitions, fun runs and events than, um, uh, than towards uh, you know, looking around for a session to join in with. And we're working with European athletics and hopefully UK and England athletics on promoting some actual technical standards for exchange of results and fixture information within the sport. Great, thank you, Andy. Um, Nick? Oh yeah, it's Nick Evans from Sport England. Um, my role is on helping deliver this programme with the ODI, um, but also from a kind of, I suppose, from an internal Sport England perspective. In terms of the data standards, we evidently have a national facilities database for active places, which has a lot of venue information, facility information. Um, and the other thing we're very interested in at the moment is the development of the activity lists because that we see as a kind of fundamental building block for the sector and, and from our internal purposes that is very closely linked to how we report on participation in sport for active live survey which is about to go first release of that data is going to happen tomorrow. I'm also joined here by my colleague uh, Alison Savage as well from our inside director. Okay, hello both of you. Um, Kim. Hey, how you doing? Um, so I work for Leicestershire and Rutland Sports. This is one of the 45 county sports partnerships in England. Um, and uh, I'm here promoting, our, um, I'm working with our product, Sports Suite, which is actually done as a joint venture arrangement with a company called Cutterfish Multimedia. So between the two of us, we hope to bring their sports specific side and then Cutterfish provide the tech side. Um, I'm actually here uh, through invitation from Nick Evans from ODI or I'm in or whoever is here representing today himself apparently. Um, so uh, we're kind of here in an observing capacity because I didn't actually get your agenda. So I, I'm not entirely sure what's being covered today, but I'm here to help and support where we can. So Sports Week, for those who don't know, is actually a... Um, a system that is made up of a number of modules that our clients can then pick and choose which ones they want to uh, enhance their website offer to sport and physical activity users. We currently have over half of the county sports partnerships in England using our um, system. So it's used for data collection really. We have a venue database, an activity finder, a volunteering opportunity feed, a funding finder, a job search engine, um, we do activity bookings and events bookings. So it's all in one system and put into one shared database that's shared across all the CSPs, um, but also uh, to universities, um, etc., local authorities. <clears throat> and we have a fixture system as well. So we coordinate all of, uh, we have a system that we can coordinate all fixtures um, for school age or MGB level as well. So we've got quite a lot of data that, that's going into our uh, system. So I'm here just to... Uh, learn more about the open data element and what we can provide. And somebody previously just said about the um, activity list. Uh, we have shared one or tried to through the W3 platform. So I think that will hopefully be sent out. So that's our first sort of foray with supporting with this. Um, yeah, so that's me. Great. Thanks, Kim. I, I did share that out earlier. So I think it has gone through, uh, through to the list. Okay. Um, and I think we have uh, somebody on the phone as well. No. Okay. okay. I imagine that's Sport Labs, um, which is, if it is Sport Labs, because they've been coming and going, uh, they're a, uh, a booking system that the LTA, Lawn Tennis Association, uh, and England Athletics uh, are using. Um, that's a fair representation. Um, I'm not sure where he's gone now. <laughs> I think he was on the phone before. Is okay. that sport, sport Labs, did you say? Yeah, yeah. Sport, lab. sport Labs, yeah. Thanks. Okay, um, so thank you everyone for the introductions. Uh, it was really interesting to hear about the kind of mix of different projects that you're all working on and that uh, some form of data sharing or open data is core to that. Um, uh, it means you're in the right place. Um, so uh, what I want to, uh, wanted to do with this call today is um, get some feedback from you all on um, the document that I shared uh, before Christmas, 
um, called uh, modeling opportunity data. Um, the, just to kind of set out how I'm uh, kind of wanted to approach the kind of standards development work. Um, what I'm hoping we can do is um, get some agreement on in the terms of the, the, the scope of the types of data that we need to publish as part of this uh, piece of work. So, um, uh, you know, just agreeing on that we need to be describing events and venues and facilities and activity lists so that we're all on the same page with respect to um, how we define those things and how they relate to one another. Um, and then I want to kind of uh, uh, then dig into the details of uh, how we need to describe those things. So how we need to structure activity lists, the different ways that we need to describe opportunities and events um, so that they can be um, uh, discoverable and, and, and made uh, clear to people who may, be, uh, who may want to take part in them. Um, so really what I've did, the, the kind of document I've shared so far is really focusing on that first piece. It's just trying to define some terms and a kind of scope of what, um, what we'll be looking at. Um, so um, uh, hopefully you've all had a chance to have a look through it. Um, this is the, the document. Um, it's uh, linked from the open access site and I did circulate it in the, in the agenda. Um, at the minute, there's just kind of two, uh, two sections to it. Um, there's a, a kind of introduction which kind of sets out um, initially the kind of the scope of uh, what we're looking at. Um, so really just identifying that there is a range of different types of data that's relevant to describing physical activities, um, but trying to highlight the fact that what we're focusing on in this uh, initial activity um, is describing opportunity data. So we're not getting into any of the participation data or more sensitive things. So it's really about um, events, where they take place, descriptions of the events and ways that we can categorize them. I think that everybody should feel comfortable about sharing more openly. Um, so the, the, the next section of the document um, defines what I think are the, um, what I'm proposing is the kind of the core uh, resources that we we're gonna be describing. So um, activities, so that's the, the, the type of activity, exercise or sport that's involved uh, in the events. Um, what I've proposed that we call programs, which is a kind of looser way to describe those events. Um, uh, locations, so obviously the, the place in which uh, the events take place, um, which, which from what I can see and from some of the research that um, Sally has done already, um, is just is described in uh, different levels of detail. You know, in some cases it might be um, uh, an actual latitude and longitude or, or, or a particular um, location in a, a leisure centre, or it might just be more broadly, you know, near the near the lake in the park. Um, so we need some kind of flexibility there. Um, and then the core of it is obviously the event descriptions themselves. Um, I've seen that there's some different terminology in use around whether people are referring to events or sessions. Um, so there's some discussion of kind of those definitions in the document. Um, the uh, the other second section in the, in the in the document is um, identifying how those uh, different uh, resources, different entities map to um, schema.org. Um, if you're not familiar with that, then it's, um, this is a, an open uh, data model that is supported by Google and another, uh, a number of the other major search engines um, that is helping people publish data online. Um, there's a lot of a kind of well-defined vocabulary there for describing events in locations, which is already in use in other sectors. So um, what I'm hoping is that we can uh, as long as we all agree on that the, the kind of scope and the alignment is is correct that we can draw on a lot of that existing work to kind of accelerate what we're doing so we can instead focus on um, the important ways to describe opportunities rather than debating um, you know uh, what an event is uh, or how we describe you know where they take place and that kind of thing um, so that's broadly um, where I got to with, with the document. Um, and as part of um, putting that together, um, I've created a, a number of um, issues. Um, so there's a, a GitHub project 
which um, has uh, which we're going to be using for coordinating work on the specification and feedback. Um, I filed a number of issues in there um, that relate to questions and discussions that I think we need to have as a group. Um, and I want to get into at least one or two of those in the rest of the call. Um, I've also started to work on putting together some um, uh, example data um, that illustrates how that, that existing model, um, existing vocabulary can be used to describe um, opportunities and facilities. So what I'm drawing on here is um, some of the open data that I think I believe, I believe some of you are already publishing as part of Open Active. So I've been taking um, some of the data that's available in the existing um, real-time paging spec and just expressing it in terms of the schema.org uh, model just to kind of prove out that alignment. Okay, so that's a kind of quick tour through the, um, through the document. And I had a few questions that I wanted to put to you as a group. Um, so, so firstly, just in terms of the scope of that model and the kind of key concepts, um, so uh, events and programs and activities, do you feel that that is um, the right kind of thing that we should be focusing on? Do you think there's anything that's missing? I'm just going to open that up to anybody who wants to, to, wants to uh, contribute. Yeah, this is Kim. Can I just mention something on that? Um, sure. So we categorise ours slightly differently. I, admittedly, I haven't read that document. I've only just been sent a link privately from Nick to have a quick gander at it. Um, so forgive me if this is already covered. But um, so we break ours down by events or sessions as two different things. Um, reason being, it's just it's just how it's worked well with our, with our clients. And to define that, a session would be something like a Zumba class or, you know, it's something that's happening every week, a football session, it's something you'll be going to. An event is like a one-off event, so it's like your open day or something along those lines. What we found when you were adding um, uh, like sessions that are happening every week and events are quite different and might want to be highlighted differently. Um, you know, one big old everyone come along would get lost in amongst every Friday Zumba class, for example. So it was quite key, at least to our lot, to actually separate those two out. So anyone that adds any sessions, they, they pick whether it's an ongoing session or if it's a one-off thing. And that's not just us that use that. As athletes, who I also believe are part of this group, but I don't appear to have called in today, because um, we're actually currently looking at linking with our systems and, and they break it down into events and sessions too. So just, just one from, just from ours, it might be different from other people, but so um, yeah, so our CSP clients will do that. The other thing is you mentioned programs, and again, apologies, I'm not a chance to read it, but um, we break our things down separately again under programs and campaigns. Now, programs and campaigns, um, people have their different definitions, but the way we refer to them is campaigns are time stamped. So <clears throat> for example, um, we have a lot of uh, events and sessions that might be linked to, uh, I don't know, get back to hockey week or um, stand up for Britain day or what have you. And so those sessions are then linked to a campaign and they're time stamped so that when those campaigns have ended, that then comes off because there's nothing worse than having them all the time. However, programs are like NGB endorsed programs. So for example, a, a table tennis loop program. That hasn't got an end date. That's an ongoing program to try and engage their workplaces in, in the table tennis. So that is a program, and then we have that on system. So basically, if somebody's interested in table tennis, they can see all the, uh, the table tennis programs. It might be a workplace one, it might be something else. Um, and they, they can see all the sessions that are linked to that program that they can do as part of it. But if they just want to take part as part of an awareness campaign in a short period of time, then that's also on there under a timestamp. Um, so it just makes sure that all our stuff stays current. One thing that we've always loathed is you know activity finders and, and information where it says stuff and the programs ended a year ago or the campaign was actually last year's campaign. So yeah, so basically events and sessions and then they link, both can link to either programs or campaigns and that's our distinction, whether or not that's something that everybody else does or, or not. I just thought I'd throw that out there. That's really great input, Kim, thank you. Um, does anybody want to chip in? Are you using similar um, classifications or does anyone um, want to offer? Lee, I just wanted to ask a question actually. Yep. Um, sorry if this is a bit dumb, but <laughs> um, in terms of the categories that we're sort of agreeing on here, are these the categories that we're agreeing on in order to get consistency of understanding of data or categories that we're agreeing on that we have to use 
externally facing to consumers? Because um, to me, that's the, the two different conversations to be had around that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what we're focusing on at the moment is just trying to cons um, be consistent in how we're describing the events. So the, um, the types of categories we're using, not um, at this stage saying, okay, you have to use these terms. So um, okay. not saying that everybody has to use the same activity list, but that everybody is um, referring to activities in the same way. Yeah, um, so I think because I think everyone could go into lots and lots of detail in terms of we call programs this or we call activities that and externally facing everyone will, will have their own ways of displaying things. But if this is about agreeing some terminology and language that we're going to use for the data sharing, which is behind the scenes, it's a lot easier question, uh, conversation to have than the externally facing stuff. Yeah, I, I totally, totally agree. It's, it's important to get that clear. Some, in a nutshell, I would have thought, are we saying someone can call it whatever they want on a public facing bit, as long as it's all called the same thing behind the scenes? Is that what we're saying? That's a question, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so the, the way that you structure this data internally in your system, obviously, it is up to you. And we're not going to be just um, saying that you need to enforce that people describe their programs or campaigns or activities in a single way because um, that, that wouldn't be workable. But what we need to do is make sure that when the data is shared, that everyone can understand the thing, what, what's being described. Yeah. So it's really think, just trying to yeah. get some high level buy, um, buy in. Oh, Lee, yeah. can I just butt in here? I think one thing we have to consider here is that, yes, there is difficulties moving across, but if you're a consumer, and you're coming to this the first time, we're trying to drive forward behavioural change, then a lot of the descriptions that we have at the moment, which is a problem we have with swimming, with 5,000 descriptions of swimming that we've surfaced, it doesn't make sense for the consumer when they're first searching for this. You know, the first touch point they want, want to have is a very simple terminology. So if we continue to progress lots of things described in multiple different ways that make a lot of sense to a governing body but don't make sense to the consumer the governing body needs to understand that at the back end agree that will create that will not that will create tension so it's a kind of bit of a we're talking about a kind of bit of a transition i think here is what we're trying to drive forward but ultimately we want to get forward to a standard activity list that is very simplified that may have different ways of tagging it behind but if a, if a if someone surfaces up swimming to search with, they get swimming back kind of thing. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's always useful. Apologies for, for stealing a thunder, Nick, but uh, sorry, Nick, Tother Nick. Um, when you start to draw parallels between what we're trying to do here and, for example, what exists in the travel sector, um, and so, well, you know, there are hundreds of platforms that allow consumers to search for travel options, whether it's hotels or, or whatever. But the common, the language, the consumer generally is is a common one, I would suggest, and it's a, it seems like a fairly similar parallel here. Yeah, I don't think there's any contradiction between what's being said. As I said, as I understand it, if if we move to things like activity list, or I'd call it an activity type list, and the more the co that a common vocabulary is used, the easier for the person consuming that list. Albeit, you know, we will have synonyms and misspellings and whatever to, to convert between them. Um, that's separate from what we call the tables and the properties. Uh, and it could well be, for example, that uh, in this model, an event covers what Kim sees as both an event uh, and an activity, but an event has a single date and an activity has recurring dates. Now, Kim may then want to present that in completely different colors and with different terminology on a website. But as far as the data model is concerned, we all call, call it something divorced from, from her web apps. But the actual naming of things which, you know, activity types, you know, consistency helps. Yeah, and I would have thought that's more important it, it's to, in the back end to be calling it because something consistent, otherwise you can't share effectively. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an important part of, of the, 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 data, the open data standard as well, because consumers need to understand that they, um, that, you know, the property uh, that they're seeing from one data source is equivalent to, to elsewhere. Um, 
so I mean it really is just a very simple kind of uh, first pass just to kind of be happy that people are just, uh, that, that we're not, I'm not missing any requirements around describing you know recurring events or the relationship between campaigns and events or events and, uh, and activities um, what I think would would really help, I don't know how much work it is, is to have sort of half a dozen examples of of each thing to see whether they fit in. I mean, this is what we view as a program and this is what its properties are. This is what we view as an event or an activity and just, just make sure that they fit that model. They needn't all be expressed out in, you know, it's in machine readable form, just something which just tests it against real life scenarios. Yeah, and I, Sally did some work on um, on reviewing that the way that the data has been um, uh, expressed by different platforms. I mean, Sally, do you want to? It might be unfair to call on you, but is there anything you want to uh, share about that work? Uh, yeah, put me on the spot. Thanks, Lee. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Uh, yeah, so what we've been doing in the past was, as you say, to basically look through um, how certain um, sets of data were dealing with this kind of thing, both in terms of things like language and also um, as Lee's captured in his document, um, some of the sports and activities have differences in terms of how they treat common concepts, such as things like locational timing. Um, so that was one of the things that we're really keen to actually expand a little bit on, both in order to kind of work out um, how different everybody's data was um, and obviously what the impact is on that if we are going to start to implement standards and how best we can support people, but also to feed back into our understanding so that we do have this really broad view of everything. Um, so we, we have done a little bit of work into looking at that, but we would definitely welcome anybody who has um, got this kind of information that they're willing to share with us. Um, we will obviously feed back that into the team and to sort of um, start to use that in terms of the standards that Lee's following and putting together. Um, so yeah, absolutely happy to kind of hear from anybody else who has other things they want to share with us. Is it, is, oh my, is it, is it a case that it sounds like what you're talking about is trying to establish how many blocks there are or how many things there are and with common attributes. And then the terminology of how we name them is, 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 sort of separate in some ways that we can establish there are 20 different types of things that have these common attributes and then whether we call them program or events or sessions or whatever is something to be sorted out in parallel but separately yes yeah let, let me share a um let me just share my screen because i have a, a diagram which will maybe just uh, uh, this is something that i need to put into the the specification but it just kind of shows how these uh, how these things fit together. Um, hopefully you can see that um, it's not too, not too small, let's see if I can make it slightly larger. So um, we're talking about, uh, you know, the central thing here is an event, something that's taking place at a place and time. Um, so the event is then associated with a, a place, which is what schema.org calls it, so a location, which can be specified to different levels of precision. Um, that we can also um, have a hierarchy between places. So we can say that one place is contained in another. So that allows us to, for example, to say that a uh, particular leisure facility is broken down into, um, into pitches, swimming pools, um, running tracks. So we can describe the kind of venues. Um, so moving across the other side of the diagram, we have uh, events are associated with activities. So this is how we say that you know, this event is going to involve uh, swimming or, or yoga. Um, and activities can be described as a hierarchy, um, which seems to be the, the common pattern that everyone's using so that we can have kind of broader and narrower relationships. So we can say that there are you know, 10 different types of yoga, um, but all relate them back to yoga as a broader category so that um, somebody can uh, potentially look for just any kind of uh, opportunity to take part in yoga or look for a particular type of yoga that they're interested in. Um, and the, the activities are organized into activity lists. So what I feel is that uh, over time, what we would want is for people to be ideally using the same activity list. So there's a common one in the sector, but in order to kind of move things forward now, we need people to at least share the name, what names of activities they're using, and ideally publish their lists. 
because by, by doing that, we can start to identify where the alignments are between the different lists that people are using. That, that's useful, Lynn. I think uh, it sounds <clears> like the job is to marry that with bearing in mind what Kim was saying and having a clear definition of what each of those boxes uh, represents. Yes, and that, that's, that's what I'm trying to get from this first version of the specification, is yeah. just make sure that we haven't missed anything. Yeah. So um, Kim may say activity in our language is, is X, whatever. Activity list in our language is Y, and hopefully we can evolve and settle on what we're calling it commonly uh, and take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that mapping process is part of what you would go through in order to publish the data. Um, but we need to at least have a common agreement in this group about what we're talking about when we're trying to specify different bits of this model. Um, so, I just to jump in as well quickly, sorry. I was just going to say, I think it's also important um, to establish where we draw those boundaries as well, because we've obviously been looking at um, a range that are, you know, across different activities, different sports, that kind of thing. Um, but if you've got something that drastically differs, we'd like to hear about those outliers as well, because we would like to standardize um, the core of it, whilst understanding that there are going to be these other attributes which are a sort of, you know, less common or which maybe shouldn't be part of the standards initially or might grow to be. Um, but again, where we actually draw that line will be a really important thing to establish. So if you've got something that is horrendously different to this, please don't discount it. We'd love to hear about that as well. Yes. Can I ask a question yeah. about the organisation or the place structure? Um, yeah, sure. Because you mentioned about having hierarchy on there, and we do the same as well. But um, maybe it's just because it's quite small and I can't quite see it. But how does that, your product place, how does your place break down into a hierarchy? Because, yeah, we do the same. So, for example, if we have like I, uh, YMCA National, and then you'd have like YMCA East Region, and then beneath that you might have YMCA Leicestershire, or Voluntary Action, and you have Voluntary Action East Midlands, Voluntary Action Leicestershire, and people can take ownership of the different levels of the organisations. Is there a way of breaking the place down in a particular format, or is that something that you're after as well? Um, so it sounds like what you're describing is, is a kind of organisational structure. So yeah. that, I'm not, I'm not represented on here. Um, so, I mean, there's a box at the top left, which is kind of labelled organisational person. So that's the person, that's the organisation that might be, uh, organising or running the event. Um, so I, th I think that kind of regional breakdown of organisations would need some additions to the model over here. The relationship between places was really about actual physical locations that, that you know that the leisure center is broken down into you know separate um, separate areas that you know it contains a swimming pool or um, a racetrack etc yeah sometimes they can be the same you know like an organization could actually be the facility we have yeah. a lot of like uh, events that are actual you know physical courses and things like that and they're they're organized and hosted at the same venue so an organization is also the venue. So I was just wondering how the place and the organization marry together and if there is a hierarchy breakdown at all. I think we would probably try and dis distinguish there because there, there, is a, there is an organization, there's a separate entity that is running um, that event in the location. That, that would be the, probably the way I would, I would approach modeling it. But if there's reasons for having them be the same, I'm happy to take feedback on that. Um, yeah, so what the others, like any organisation can also then distinguish themselves as a venue and so then they can then specify if things are held within that venue or within another person's venue which also doubles as the organisation. So yeah, there might be a few extra fields to add, just from our experience when people have been adding things on our system anyway that might need to be incorporated. Okay, so thank you. Lee, on that, on that bit, in, in active places we represent owners as they have a direct separate table kind of relationship with the sites. So you yeah. will have an owner who may own many sites and that's how you pick, pick that up as a separate. That's how we deal with that. The, mm. other, the other issue I was just going to raise is, is, although we're not dealing with it yet, on the diagram, I think it would be useful to show how coaches and volunteers might fit in. It's not something we, we are kind of address, or looking to address at this point, but I think it is good to show where they would fit into this because evidently there's with wider work starting on on coaching and volunteering kind of databases and development separately what do you mean nick um i think you're right but um well i suppose it's 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 if you're a coach you know how are you going to it's the kind of classic case if you had a venue relationship you know 
you, you, your personal trainer, you will be associated with a number of venues. Okay. And you will deliver a certain number of activities. So it's how does that individual would be represented on this? But uh, does, this, does that also, well, you're right to talk about um, coaches, um, sort of volunteers and coaches, but also the, the wider extension of that is also participants, is it not? And it's almost, it's a very valid thing, but it's, it needs to be linked, but it's... The well, yeah, but I suppose right. there is, the, I know what you mean by the participants, but I think at the moment it's where you're going to, if you're surfacing stuff back, eventually back to the consumer and the consumer's looking for personal trainers and things like that. And that's, oh, I see, yeah. That's, okay. that's more about it. It's, it's thinking again what they're going to search for. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that kind of stuff. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. I think, I think there's a space to fit that in. Um, so um, I, I'm keen to hear from um, the rest of you as well. I mean, has anyone um, got a model that is wildly different to this? Um, um, have you got a very different view of the world? Or is um, this broadly... Um, it's not wildly different, but I've got one I wouldn't mind sharing for a few seconds, just coming at things from some slightly different angles, which... Uh, is it possible to share screen for a second? Um, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll just try and see if it'll let me do a particular window. Uh, okay, I'll minimise. So, uh, are you getting a diagram at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so this is... Uh, this is a model we're working to for the sport of athletics, but quite by coincidence, we met some people from the French Federation about 10 years ago who said that was exactly what they'd ended up with and it had worked in practice. And uh, in brief, and there's people, organizations, competitions, and a person can have a role in an organization. So they may be a coach, they may be an athlete, they may, um, it, now, I, I don't think we're really talking about tracking participants because you get into a lot of personal data issues, but generally the people who are coaching in a sport are nationally registered or have certain certifications and it's reasonable to display some info about them. Um, and uh, similarly, organizations, uh, you know, competitions, we're focusing on competitions. In your case, it's activity events and sessions, but they take place in a venue which may be managed by an organization. Um, I mean, that's, we're starting to accumulate a lot of data in this format for one sport in the UK, but it, it's a model that's known to work pretty well and we're very happy to share it and hopefully we'll have you know, Jason packets coming out very, very soon if that's useful. Um, I think um, the other thing I'd suggest, coming back to your diagram from a few minutes ago, uh, yeah, sample data is massively helpful, but I think from the top down, it would be great if we could look to Sport England and say, well, can we start with a standard re regional hierarchy, maybe just in an indented text file in GitHub? Um, for the sports, there's a long list of the ones recognized by Sport England. If we just say, let's standardize how we spell all of those, capitalize them all, strip out the spaces or something, you've got codes to begin working with and we're already at work on a standard data set. So I tend to, I mean, I've always tended in the open source world towards just rolling some sleeves up, putting something out there and letting people criticize examples rather than spending too long on the standards. But there must be enough meat there that we could quickly stick a couple of these hierarchies in a text file for people to look at and say, what's wrong with this? And then if you get heated arguments over how many types of yoga they are, that's great. They're all under a standard code spelt Y-O-G-A. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that's, uh, that, that's useful, Andy. Uh, mm -hmm. um, that's exactly what I've been doing kind of behind the scenes, uh, 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 prepping for the kind of next phase. Mm -hmm. So I have um, the activity list from Sport England to share. Um, mm -hmm. Kim shared her activity list to the, um, to the mailing list earlier today. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to do exactly that so people could see the different lists that are in use. Um, so yeah, uh, and there's also, I'll share it after the call, but there also is a GitHub repository <laughs> that has uh, some sample data in there, both in terms of the mm. spec, but also just links and pointers to um, mm. data sources. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm very keen that we don't just focus on the spec, but also kind of have examples to work from. Mm. As we go. Um, I'm just kind of mindful of the time. So I'm just wondering is, um, uh, uh, Nobody's kind of said that there's anything that's radically different. So can, I, assume that we're can I just right prompt? Um, can I just uh, just prompt on this, uh, Ben? Sorry to single you out. Uh, on your, uh, I, I know you've got some thoughts in terms of categorising them at a higher level around the 
you know the, the different categories that these these activities would fit into which i don't think was represented on that diagram is it worth just doing just um yeah i mean my thoughts are around sort of the the structure of um our activity list so sort of the broader categories going down into um the names of sports and um how many sort of levels we just ha how sort of uh yeah how, how many levels of, of taxonomy we decide to um to use so when a user is browsing um yeah for, for example um yeah they've gone looking for football but then they might drop back a level into all sports because they may be in sort of discovery mode and not looking specifically for one for one sport um and then there's also um the fact that people can be looking for different things in different places um just to pick an example um canoe polo could be categorized under polo or it could be uh, which isn't an aquatic sport but you may also be looking um through aquatic sports as a category so i, I think um there's this issue of um sort of things will have one place to live but then you may also want to link um sort of have links back to other categories if that does that make sense yeah the standard way of dealing with that is what they call polyhierarchical lists whereby something sits in a list once but has two parents so canoe polo is a child of aquatic sports and child of polo um, and it, you know, as long as we agree the rules for the, the list for that, including you know, does it have a fixed number of levels or has it have as many levels as is needed for the sport, then if those rules are articulated, software consuming it should be written to deal with that. I'd say um, that, and um, Ben, I'd agree with that because with our activity list, we have two levels of exercise. Uh, so we'd need at least a third level for the consumer to, to not have too many on that one level. Um, I was just going to, if that's okay, just a, a couple of things that I was thinking of in terms of the activity lists as well and, and standardisation. One of the flags that, that brings with me is the updating and of such standardised lists, particularly with something like group exercise. We, we created a standardised list about three months ago and it's already out of date so um any thoughts that might be had around that and then in terms of the model the um if we're looking um, like uh, nick for england nick said in terms of um terminology being consumer facing also there's some conversations to be had around um I think someone picked up the around the sports suite stuff and um, if you're going to call something an event consumer facing that's not going to be the right terminology for everyone people would perhaps see it as a session more than an event so the event would be a one-off and then the the around the program and um, the terminology of that as well and um, some of the programs in the examples are actually brands people would have more affinity with the brand of zumba than calling something a program and i just think there's some, some more thrashing out of that terminology to be had yeah, there's definitely that case, especially with dance. Um, what I've sent in my email that went this morning is because if you're also a sporting organisation more so than the physical activity dance side, and there is an awful lot of dance types of classes. I'm not surprised that your list is almost out of date after three months. It's, it's <laughs> massive. Um, so what we did is, uh, like, we've actually <clears throat> been quite selective and we used very generic terms. So we were like, it's a step class. We didn't put Les Mills step or body con step or, you know, all the variations and brands when you there within there. Purely because, like you said, trying to stay on top of it, we personally didn't have the capacity or the expertise to be able to do it. Obviously, if this is going in an open data route, then that's where we'd be taking all of your listing from with regards to the dance side. For us, we kind of went, right, sport is our bread and butter. We know that. We can map the sports in. For dance, we, you know, we did a category of uh, EMD and then so exercise movement and dance. And then under that, it was, you know, step and yoga and, you know, those sort of top level names. And then as and when we had people requesting something sub to be put on it, then they were then put underneath. But we tried to keep it 
to the real recognised ones like Zumba, to be fair, that's on there, but everything else we kept top level. So this is where the open data bit will be quite useful, at least for us, to try and get the darn side, because it is where, where we personally sort of fall down a bit. And um, just linking to what somebody said before as well about the, the categorizations, I think it was Nick from my, uh, no, somebody from my men. Um, <clears throat> we also have a sort of a, 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 a top level as well where we break things down by sport, physical activity and well-being. I don't know if that's something that anybody else does because obviously there's definitions, you know, between what sport is, what physical activity is and this and then well-being. Um, but that was just our sort of top level and then all sports and activities are, are categorised as such. And then we also have um, 28 different possible categories that activities can be linked to, and they can link to as many of those as they want. And that's, again, more just a filter of to be honest, for the end user. So we have things such as like Olympic sports. So if somebody wanted to then filter all of the activities that were seen as an Olympic sport would, would then come up. Um, so we have 28 of those, like ball sports, traditional sports, etc. which again, they are, they are more for the user end, but it's just something that behind the scenes we keep them all categorized so that they can we can do whatever we want with that data then um on the front facing websites so just something else to be aware of yeah sorry lee it's nick here i mean i would i would actually just pick up tim's point there because it's after we've kind of battled with this and i've spent you know a lot of time looking at these and it's done my head in basically when I mean, you look at working with some of the governing bodies over this so actually trying to create the hierarchies just doesn't work so actually creating a series of tags that are very they can keep adding to those tags and we'll find them because the governing bodies are the problem. As soon as a new sport emerges or goes off a different slant, then if you've got a hierarchy, then you're gonna to have to adjust it and it doesn't never fits properly. So it'd be much better just having that very high level list and then a whole load of tags. You know, if it's canoeing, you can have all the subtypes of canoeing with it and the fact it's water sports, it's an Olympic sport, Paralympic sport, whatever, and that will make it a lot easier to manage in the future, I think, in terms of when we think about this being in a iterative process and these things are going to change yeah okay that, that's useful input everybody thank you yeah um you know, just to add to that as well uh you know certainly from our point of view uh with our with our software we have also found that our users tend to uh you know, tend to classify all of their all of their products that they want to set up all of their all their classes activities etc uh into two different classification mechanisms one of which uh, would be a hierarchy and the and the the second one always always takes the form of a tag search um <clears throat> just because uh we have learned over time that the way the way one user views a views a hierarchy is always going to be different to the way a, a another set of users view that view that same hierarchy so you know that's that's the bit i was going to add on that um there was one other bit as well which was uh when we when we're talking about the you know, the the uh, the higher level concept of a of a of a single event uh, and then and then something which has got sessions on it um, <clears throat> from our perspective uh, we have have got cases where there is a single event where there is only one session if you want to think about it that way um, but then we also do move on to cases where we have a known start and end date uh, where there'll be a fixed number of sessions for a certain activity um, and uh, we then have a further use case as well, which is uh, you can set something up with a recurrence pattern uh, where you're going to say it is going to run every n hours sometimes uh, with a with a certain duration. Um, so I'm just mindful of whatever uh, schema we choose to publish this on. We could uh, well we need to factor in the fact that there could be tens of thousands of sessions uh, over. You know, over a book ahead period, which you know could be uh, in some of our cases, we have up to two years in advance that you can book some of these sessions. So you know uh, we just need to bear in mind that the number of sessions that you could have for a single activity could be in the tens of thousands. Yes, that that that's useful. Um, I, I've uh, anticipated some of that in the current, um, the current model. Um, so the. Uh, uh, the event kind of framework allows for um, parent and child events, so we could have we could describe a uh, a campaign or a program as a broader event, which is then brought, uh, broken down into separate sessions. Um, but one of the things that schema.org doesn't currently do is allow you to specify recurring events in the way that you describe. So more of a kind of calendar entry that it's going to repeat to a schedule, and that's something that I've actually been working with. Um, them on to kind of add that in as a missing piece to their model. So rather than 
necessarily publishing data on thousands of events, you'll actually be able to publish the recurrence rule um, so that you could you could uh, ingest that as one. Uh, okay. okay, so what I was actually going to recommend on that is that uh, whilst there, there is the chance for you to then have uh, tens of thousands of sub-events, um, I, 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 I do believe that that is the way that we should go, even though there is a lot more data, uh, just because uh, we have learned uh, in, through a lot of trial and error is that whenever you define a schedule, uh, with a with a certain pattern, you will immediately have the need for you to uh, for you to define exclusions to that pattern, um, and the 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 mechanisms that you then have to have in place for you to handle handle exclusions to the pattern start to make the usage of the data much more complicated. So from an ease of data consumption uh, point of view, it's far easier, even though it's uh, uh, you know, much more verbose, uh, for you to have every single session listed there. Uh, as well, you then also get all, all of the side benefits of you being able to have at the session level uh, the spaces, uh, you know, wait lists and you know, all that other goodness uh, is is then automatically baked in down at the session level rather than you having to have uh, further queries or further steps for you to get that for a particular session based on a, you know, on a pattern lookup. Can, can I um, actually prompt another, sorry to, to keep prompting, uh, but Raymond, I absolutely get that. That makes a lot of sense. And I've heard the debate go both ways. Uh, Luke, if you are listening from book when, uh, could you just say a little bit about the the way that you've gone about this? Because I know that you've tackled that exact problem. Yeah, I was. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I was just actually concurring, just saying yes to the screen multiple times. So while you were describing that situation, um, it's something that inevitably happens that a, a, a class provider or a, a session provider might need to cancel a class at the last minute. There'll be exceptions throughout the year. Uh, there might even be particular events where they want to advertise it as being uh, closed or postponed for for a certain amount of classes, especially when people are are used to getting into a routine of turning up at nine o'clock on a Friday for a particular activity. Um, so yeah, uh, that's another big thing for us that we do have a lot of recurring events on our system as well, and uh, like was just previously described, they can go on infinitum. Um, as long as the user specifies, really. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's how we're classifying things at the moment. We do also use some tags as well, but they're not any, they're not, they're not predefined tags. They're just done on an organization level. So they can use whatever they like to tag the acti activity with. Okay, thank you. Um, Sorry, what, what I was hoping to get out there was uh, that I think that Luke uses, at least to get, correct me if I'm wrong, you use the RCAL form with exceptions rather than storing in the database every single possible uh, thing that happens. So that might be, sorry, to, I, would, I don't want to take this uh, off tangently, but yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting debate about whether you store the RCAL form and then your data transfer is low, but then there's a bit of processing on top, or whether you literally list out everything and then your data transfer is massive, but like you say, I, so there's, the, there's the, the kind of, I think there's a good debate to have, probably not now, but um, yeah. Yeah, I believe it's the iCal uh, format that we use. Um, my technical knowledge of the subject is, is pretty poor, but yeah, to clarify it's, uh, specifically, it's, it's iCal, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and that, that's the basis of the, the, the schema.org extension that I've been working on, um, is, is based on iCal. Um, but it's useful to get those issues surfaced. Um, okay. I'm uh, mindful of the time. I, I don't want us to run over too late. Um, but so I'm going to leave you with a couple of requests because I, I keep to keep this discussion going. So I'd like to kind of take it to the mailing list so that we um, start to debate some of these issues. Um, what I'm taking away from this call is that, um, that nobody has any major issues with the shape of the current model, that it kind of broadly aligns with what we're doing, but there's some discussion to be had around the detail of structuring of activity lists, tagging of events, and description of scheduling. Um, I've got GitHub issues that cover all of those already, so I'd, I'll, I'll direct you to, to those so that you can add your comments. Um, and I think the, the thing I'd like to, to leave you with as well, um, which we didn't really get time to cover today, is some of the other ways that we ne might need to describe and categorize events. So I'm thinking things like um, age suitability, um, fitness levels required, equipment required, 
it'd be useful to get some insight from each, all of you about those other types of descriptive properties that we need to put onto events because it's not covered in schema.org already because it's mostly about um, kind of a more generic event model. So these are the areas that we need to kind of focus on for, for opportunity. Ladies, I'm just gonna say, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, Lee, I was just going to say, feel free to um, circulate the information that I sent you about those extra bits in our group exercise activity lists as well. Great, thank you, Jade. I will do that. Um, sorry, very briefly, Lee, there's just one other um, issue we haven't touched on, which was to do with the place um, uh, definitions. Um, uh, in the context of Devon, where we have a very remote, some very remote communities and so on, um, but even in places like Torbay, we're getting, starting to get examples of people working, um, effectively having virtual spaces. So people actually coming together to work together to um, have a training session or whatever, but actually virtually um, meeting to do that. So we just need to perhaps future proof by uh, ensuring what we arrive at will cover that kind of scenario. Okay, that, that's an interesting use case, Andy. Thank you. Um, um, follow, follow up with that, right, that, get a bit more, get some examples. Um, just on that last point, I do know that the place object that you have in, uh, well, on, on schema.org does, it does let you have free text. So certainly on the virtual side of things, if there's a, if there's a virtual meeting point that they've got or, you know, somewhere where they meet you online, you know, that could just uh, be part of the, you know, of the place data is the URL or, you know, uh, the physical place they're meeting online. Um, in terms of the uh, the prerequisites uh, for for a certain activity, um, Lee, uh, I, I would point you uh, at uh, on schema.org. There is a type uh, called people audience, uh, which uh, does let you specify some of the things that we're looking for uh, for you to specify minimum ages, gender restrictions, and things like that. Um, so we may be able to take that and uh, use it with maybe a maybe a subclassing of it or something like that. Yes, yeah, so I think I think that could be useful, um, and I, I think we'll, what we'll have is the same situation with activities that there will be some some properties to be able to associate that information with an event. But we'll probably find that people are using different terminology, so different age range spreads. So it'd be useful to get those that kind of information if you can share it um, from your from your various systems. So again, we can look at what the kind of alignment is. Um, so um, that, that's been a, a very useful call from my point of view. It's useful to get some feedback from all of you. Um, sorry, I got any... Duncan, can I, can I prompt you to say whatever you were trying to say the last three times? <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Um, it, I, you just leave, I think I've understood it now. When you said other, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you said other attributes of sessions or activities, is that right? Yeah. And other in addition to what is in, what is in this back under 3.1 or so other than just saying uh, an event is involves this activity at this place and time and will be organized by this personal group yeah so the ones you've listed under 3.1 um yeah let me just check the specs i'm seeing the right reference yeah other than those things yes other than those yeah because there will be there will be lots and to get that decent global list and and price it down or whatever, it, you know, is important. Um, yeah, so there's, it's this, specifically it's section 312 in the spec, so describing participation requirements and restrictions. Yeah, so uh, okay, there we go. There's, yeah. there's four broad classes of, of information that I think we've identified so far, so it'd be easy to just get some. Feedback. Any others within there, yeah, I'm sure yeah. people can think of them, um, yeah. Um, I think also going back, to, sorry, what someone touched on earlier, uh, a good idea with that is because that's going to vary from sport to sport and activity to activity. Is if, if there's a standard list that gets put out yeah. and thrown out to NCDs and, and schools, because what you're going to need for basketball is absolutely, December, et cetera. Absolutely. You end up, you're going to end, and ideally, you should end up with almost a generic list, but then there will be lots of sport specific. Uh, lists of attributes yeah. that will need to be borne in mind and it's that balance I guess between being really prescriptive and having a select from something that's a, uh, that, that, that we've identified and that horrible notion of other which nobody really likes because you can't really share that but it's yeah it's, it's a minefield um, yes yeah so 
we, oh. we do need to kind of converge on that that what's the common requirements across different sports different types of activity and focus on those first so that we can make sure that we can share as much data as possible and then add the kind of refinements or extensions from there. So the focus on the generic across, in theory, all sport and physical activity? Um, and yes. all for now the sport specific stuff, are you kind of saying that? It's fine, but I'm just clarifying. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah, I mean, this, the same thing applies to describing um, venues. So I was looking at, for example, um, uh, you know the, the the very detailed ways that cycling tracks are described. Sure. Um, I don't think we need to need to address all of those up front because they're very specific to cycling. But mm -hmm. um, it's something that we would obviously want to be able to share in the future. Nick, I'm in. Did you do do some work around this in in in, in, in setting up uh, open sessions, or is that already been taken into account? Nick. He's on mute. Uh, so you didn't, oh, I was singing great things you didn't hear. Uh, so uh, Ben uh, might be good to comment on that. But yes, yeah, in terms right. of the, the question on whether we've come up, whether there was a work on activity lists done as part of open sessions, was that the question? Uh, yes, and these kind of attributes of sessions. Yeah, um, that's right. So th so they're, they're exactly. So open sessions does have a kind of uh, uh, almost a user from the UX side. We've got a kind of. Uh, bottom up this seems to work for most sessions that we've come across uh, except for Aikido and one other Ben might find might know more oh, well, we don't need to get into the specifics yeah. now but so you've already done some of that work and it, that has already been born in mind in, in, in what Lee's produced I, 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 I assume to be added in uh, yeah did you guys look at open sessions in your research Lee Sally yeah yeah okay Okay, um, unless there's any other final comments, then I'm going to suggest we wrap up the call for today um, and we'll schedule another one in the next, next couple of weeks. But like I said, this is really useful discussion and I'm keen to, to carry this forward on, on the mailing list. So if you've got uh, additional comments, uh, example data to share, um, or things that you think would be useful to the ongoing work, then please I encourage you to, um, to share that with the wider group. Leo, I would I would suggest if you if you don't you want to do this with some kind of regularity to maybe try and establish some dates over a, a few months or whatever, even if you then don't feel there's an even we end up cancelling them, but um, trying to get this number of people to coordinate a start in the diary could be challenging. Yeah, there is a um, there is, we did set up a shared calendar, and I think what I'd like to, I, I've done doodle polls for the last couple of events. Yeah, but sure. I just get it into a regular um, probably a regular fortnightly session from now on. Yeah, so the shared calendar is accessible via the... Uh, yeah, it should be linked from the website and I have emailed it around, but I'll follow okay, it up. Okay, cool. I'll dig it out again. Great, brilliant. I, I'm, I do remember saying it. Thanks. Okay. Um, right. I think on that note then, I'm going to uh, wind up the call. Um, so thanks again for everybody coming along and listening and contributing. Um, it's been really useful uh, and hopefully see you at the next one in a couple of weeks. Right. Cheers, everybody. Uh, all right.